This morning, as we have had opportunity to sing praises to your name, I pray that you have received honor and glory. I pray that as this song stated, that we would come back to the heart of worship, that we would understand how to respond in your presence. When you show up, Lord, with humble hearts, with joy, with excitement, because we know that you are the creator of all things. Father, this morning we have opportunity to continue our time worshiping through the teaching and preaching of your word. Father, we pray that it'll not return void, but Father, that you would begin the process of speaking to those who have gathered with us, speaking to their hearts, Lord, and connecting them to the idea that there is no God but you. And Father, that they would understand what salvation really looks like. Father, the, the messiness of the cross, but Lord, it's spectacular beauty because of the resurrection. Thank you so much that, that we can know today that our sins are forgiven because of Jesus, Father. In his name we pray, amen. If you have your Bibles, turn with me this morning to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2, verses 18 through 29, what we'll be looking at this morning, the church of Thyatira. How many of you have ever been in a situation where you've had to make a tough decision? Think about it for just a moment, and as you think about that moment in time where you've had to make that, that tough decision, you realize there are times in your life where you've had to make lots of tough decisions. Well, I don't like having to make tough decisions. I, I like to go up to a salad bar and see that there's chocolate cake and chest pie, and I just like to get them both. That way I don't have to make a decision, right? But sometimes you have to make a tough decision. Sometimes there's only chocolate, and then there's some other kind of cake that you're just okay with. Sometimes you, you're on a diet, and you really, as good as this cake looks, you know that if you pick that piece of cake up and take it to the table that you're probably not going to stop with just that one piece of cake. You're torn between this idea of making the right decision or making the other decision. Not all the time is the other decision wrong. Many times it is. We're going to look at a section of Scripture this morning and we're going to see where the church was doing a lot of things well. They, they had some things going good, but also there were some very disgusting things that were going on in the church. They were being taught some wrong doctrine and then the people were buying into the doctrine that they were being taught. And friends, this morning I want to make sure that you understand that there is a right way and there is a wrong way. There is a heavenly way, and then there is a worldly way, and you need to make sure that you're not torn between the two. There are really uh, three things that I want to share with you this morning, three, three main points, several um, sub-points underneath those, but let me encourage you to stand and honor the reading of God's Word this morning. Revelation 2, verses 18 and following. And to the angel of the church of Thyatira write, These things says... The Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and feet like fine brass. I know your works, love, service, faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality and she did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of their deeds. I will kill her children with death and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts. And I will give to each one of you according to your works. Now to you I say, and to the rest in Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan, as they say. 
I will put on you no other burden. But hold fast what you have till I come, and he who overcomes and keeps my works until the end, to him I will give power over the nations. He shall rule them with a rod of iron. They shall be dashed to pieces like the potter's vessel, as I also have received from my Father, and I will give to him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear this, what the Spirit says to the churches. Let's pray. Father, Lord, this morning, magnificent name of Jesus, as we approach your throne of grace, Lord, I, I just pray, I hope, my, my desire is that our hearts would truly be humbled in your presence. Father, even as we approach your throne room right now, I ask that you would begin the process of speaking to hearts, Lord, as your word has already told us that you search the mind and the hearts of those who are here. Father, your church, you search the minds and the hearts of us, and, and I pray that our minds would be focused on you. I pray that our hearts would be about serving you. Father, where conviction is needed this morning, I pray for it. Father, where peace is needed, I pray for it. Where courage is needed, I pray for it, that you would continually be honored and glorified in our midst. In Jesus' name, amen. This is, a, this is a powerful section of Scripture right here. There's so many different directions we could have gone this morning. And what we're going to do is we're just going to give you a snapshot of this whole section of Scripture, this church of Thyatira, everything that's going on. Not a lot known about this church of Thyatira, actually. Thyatira was a, a place, a, a, a business area where they dealt with fine purple linens. That's one thing we do know. Lydia was one. We talked about in the book of Acts. Lydia, she was one um, who was from Thyatira. Tyra, but, but really not a lot else we know about this particular church, uh, a lot of the things that were going on, other than what we see right here in the scripture. And what's really amazing is that through all of these seven churches, God has something positive to say about all of them except one. The church of Laodicea, we'll talk about, about that church in a couple of weeks, but the church of Thyatira, God has some good things to say, and, and I want you to hear this. This is important important is he talks about the church because I believe not only as we read and study what these churches are going through, the good things they're doing, the bad things they're doing, I think it's for a very specific group of churches that existed back in biblical days, but I also believe that, that there's some, some very real application that apply to your life and to my life as, as believers, but also collectively as a church. I think as we, we hear these, these things read off, we've got to ask ourselves individually, do I fit the mold of what Jesus is talking to the churches about? Or am, I, am I in the positive area, the, the good things that he's discussing, or, or am I in, in the bad, the foul, the ugly things that are being discussed, that Jesus is trying to convict the church about? So we see these things that, that are going on here. And, and so the church here is characterized by four very, very positive things. Wonderful things, as a matter of fact. So listen to the scripture. It says right here, to the church of Thyatira, write. It's Jesus talking to John. Then John is told to write. So Jesus is now getting ready to dictate, to share with John what needs to be shared with the church of Thyatira. These things says the Son of God. Let's make sure we understand the source of the words that are being spoken, the words that, that have been written for the church. These things says the Son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like fine brass. Friends, I want to go and share with you. you make, make sure you understand this. These, these eyes of flames like fire, you need to understand that, that God is able to see through the pretense Hypocrisy really does not work with God. Although, though many times we play church, God sees through all of that. God knows what the heart looks like. He knows those things that you're thinking, those things that you dwell on. He understands all of those things about the church. 
but he understands and knows all those things about you as an individual. So, so you need to make sure that, that your heart is right. You need to make sure that your mind is focused. You need to make sure that you're going to that source of strength on a very regular basis in order that God might give you wisdom. Paul asked for that for the, the church at Ephesus. Give you wisdom and understanding of that knowledge in Him in Ephesians 1 verse 17. That, that should be the desire of all of those who call upon the name of Jesus. That, that He would bless us with wisdom and understanding. But I'm going to tell you, He's not going to just snap His fingers like a genie in a bottle and give you that wisdom. You've got to spend time studying His Word. Reading. Praying. Communicating with Him. And so, John writes to the church as, as the Son of God shares with him these things. He says, there's some really good things that are going on there. You're doing some things really, really well. As a matter of fact, he starts it off and he says this, I know your works, the, the deeds, the things that are going on. And he says this, love is abounding there. There's a, there's a real thing. And so the church is characterized here by love. I commend you because in the church you really do have love. Now, this is agape love. Now, what exactly is he talking about this agape love? What is this exactly that's going on in the church? Well, they had love, but they had love for one another, and that's important. Because we don't always have very real, very noticeable love for one another in the church. Outside the church, we don't always have very real, very noticeable love for those that are lost. And John is writing, as Jesus dictates to him, he's saying, I see your works. Love is abounding in the church. It's love had been set apart kind of kind of sanctified they understood exactly what the son of god was talking about when he said to them you have love as a part of your works why is love so important for the church why what is the greatest commandment what is that love the lord your god with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your mind, all of your strength. The second commandment is like the first. Love your as yourself. They had very real love for one another. They, they were exhibiting this love to, with, with one another. And Jesus was commending them. He said, I see this. They went above and beyond the call of duty. It's important. Why? Well, 1 John chapter 4, verse 20 says this. If someone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? It says, it's good that you have love for me. But you can't say that I love God and go around hating your brothers. You can't go around hating your sisters. You can't go around hating everyone else who says that Jesus is Lord of their lives. You've got to love. And once love is established, then we can move on to some other things. But love is very important for you. Can you look at the one that's across from you? And can you say that I have love for my brothers? I have love for my sisters. Can you do that this morning? Well, the third church at Thyatira was able to do that. They had love for one another. But listen, also they had pistis. They had faith. What is faith? Faith is the evidence of things hoped for. Is the substance of things not yet seen. It's, it's, it's believing that God is able when no one else is. Faith. I see this chair because I see this chair. I believe that it's going to hold me. But faith is believing in the unseen because God says so. That's what Jesus was talking about here. You have, you have faith. You have great faith. It, it pissed us. It, because the Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6, without faith it is impossible to please God because he who comes to God must believe that he is. And he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Impossible to please God without faith. Faith believes that God is. 
If you were to think about all the different religions of the world, why in, in the world, over, over 4,000 religions, why? What is it that has caused you to single in and focus on the Christian faith? What is it that has caused you to single in and focus on Jesus as the Messiah? What is it that has caused you to believe that God sent his only son? What is it that has caused you to have faith? That Jesus is Lord. That Jesus has been raised from the dead. That Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father. That Jesus was born of a virgin. What is it that causes you to have that pistis kind of faith? Faith in God. The Bible says that no one at any time has ever seen God. So how do you have faith in, in the unseen? I don't always understand faith, but I've got it. Amen? That's what faith is. It's believing that there is a God. That's faith. How many of you this morning believe there is a God? Amen? How many of you believe that God sent his son to die on an old rugged cross? Come on. Amen? How many of you believe that he died and was buried in a borrowed tomb? How many? How many believe that three days later he busted the gates of hell wide open? How many? Amen? We believe that about God. That's what faith is. And, and today he is alive and well. Listen, don't mistake the chaos of the world for God being idle on his throne. He's not. He is alive and well, and everything is going to come to fruition just exactly as his word claims. Now, that excites me about my Jesus. He's coming back one day, and I say he's coming back sooner than later. Friends, better be prepared for that. So you got love, and, and now you, you have faith. Faith. But listen. He says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. So you believe that there is a God, but then he says that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. What does that mean, to diligently seek him? We don't really do this well in the church. I'm just going to go on and tell you. We have this idea of satisfaction once we confess our sins and ask Jesus to be Lord of our lives. I'm satisfied with that. I don't want to go any deeper. I don't want to go any further. I just want to sit and be satisfied. Leave me alone, preacher, is the idea that we have in the church today. Isn't it? Amen or oh me. You got to think about it. Oh me. Because we sit and we sit and we sit and we get so comfortable. But I'm going to tell you, a true follower of Jesus is not one who sits, but is one who serves. That is what the next point that I wanted to share with you is. It's, it's about service. And so we love, we have faith. But now, church, we serve. They were serving Dia Kanos. It's, it's the word for deacon that we, we use. It's made up of two Greek words, and dia is the first, which means through. Konos is, is the second, which means by dirt or dust. And so the idea here of service is someone that is so busy serving King Jesus that their feet is literally kicking up dust. Never idle. Never satisfied. Always wanting to go the extra mile. Always wanting to, to do something more. Always wanting to show God that God is loved and that his word is going to be obeyed. Always serving. Deacon. Always, and it's not just for those that have been ordained and set apart, sanctified as deacons. It's for every single person that is in here that has called upon the name of Jesus. You can serve. You can teach if you teach the Bible. You can serve and you can bring honor and glory to God if you would invite someone to know Jesus. If you would knock on a door, if you would feed the hungry, if you would clothe the poor, these things God has commanded us to do. Serve. He told the church, do you remember? Do you remember before he ascended into heaven what Jesus told the church? Go, therefore, making disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them 
So it's something that we continually do. We've got to go, we've got to make disciples, and then we've got to train. And then as you are trained along the way, you cannot stay seated. If you are in love with King Jesus, there is no reason in the world you shouldn't be so, your heart should almost explode by knowing that he has saved your soul from the pits of hell. He has done that by sending his son to the cross. Now you have confessed your sin and trusted Jesus to be Lord of your life. You should be so excited about that, so fired up about that, that even now I think you should be so just, oh my goodness, I'm just going to have to get back to it. Not satisfied, but we're satisfied. We're satisfied with little bits and little pieces of a relationship with Jesus. I'm going to say my prayers at night when I go to bed or I'm going to say my prayers in the morning and I'm going to read two minutes of Scripture and I'm going to be satisfied with that. I'm going to say something. And you can get mad at me, but you should be ashamed of yourself if that's all the relationship with Jesus you desire. Amen or oh me. Service, feet kicking up dust. Galatians 6, verse 10. Therefore, as we have opportunity, you hear it? Opportunity abounds, church. Opportunity is everywhere, church. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all. To all, especially those of the faith. Wow. Wow. Let us do good for all. Everybody. Those that are lost outside the walls of the church. But then he says this, he backs it up, but especially those of the faith for one another, that love that, that Jesus was referencing here, that, 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 that faith, that service is important. But now there has to be patience or, or perseverance because sometimes we, we hit a wall. Sometimes we find ourselves pa- facing difficult moments, difficult choices, difficult decisions. It's not always easy to be a Christ follower in the world we live in, is it church? But I'm going to tell you something. Being a Christian today, a called out one, is nothing like what being a Christian in biblical days was. They would be approached for their faith. They would be taken and shackled. They would be burned with oil. They would be burned with fire. They would be placed in the lion's den. They would be placed in a pit and have lions where they would just in these arenas where the lions would just come and ravage their bodies all because the name of Jesus had you ever experienced that this side of heaven church no no you haven't some of these practices still go on in some parts of the world but here it's easy Christianity here it's something that I just I have this this idea that I want to be a Christian but I just want to be a Christian when it feels good to me Forget the rest of the time. Perseverance is called for. People don't like to be, be told what to do very often, but, but if you tell me that I can't follow Christ, that's going to drive me to my Jesus even more. And in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12 says this, If we endure, we will also reign with Him. If we endure. If we remain faithful... If we endure, we will also reign with him. Listen to the last half. If we deny him, oh, if we deny him, he will also do what? Deny us. Deny us. Let's make that personal. If I deny Jesus in front of man, Jesus is going to deny me before who? My Father in heaven. Friends, I don't know about you, but that scares me to death to think that there's a possibility some way, somehow, that because I have little faith, because I'm not sold out to Jesus, that I might be denied because I deny him. Let that not be said of you, church. Peter had that problem three times. He denied Jesus, and then Jesus says, once you have turned back to me, Feed my sheep. Once 
You have come back to me once. You have you strayed and then as you make your way back, you make sure you do the work that you have been created for. God is calling the church to do that today. He's created the church for a purpose. And her purpose has not come to an end because she is still here, the church. Your purpose as an individual has not come to an end because you are still here. Serve and, and, and just continue to persevere whatever the cost. When we say, we like this idea to say, well, if somebody held a gun to my head, I still would not deny Jesus. Are you sure? What if someone came and threw you, said, I'm going to throw you in a pot of boiling water or boiling oil unless you deny Jesus. What would you do? If someone said, I'm going to, unless you deny Jesus, you bow down and you worship me. Unless you do that, I'm going to hang you on that cross and I'm going to burn you with fire. What decision would you make? You've never had to make a decision like that. Friends, pray that you never do. But serve and persevere while you still have opportunity. And so I want to ask you a question about your life just for a second. Are you doing those things? Are you, are you loving? Do you have faith? Are, are you serving? Are you persevering? Are you doing those things? I know the works, love, service, faith, and your patience. As for your works, the last are more than the first. They were serving. They were serving. They were faithful. You remember the church of Ephesus we talked about then? It said that their works, they had fallen away from their first love. But this, this church is actually doing more, it's, it says. Your, your works are more. What, what about your works right now? Your service to God. You, you work because of salvation. And so are you doing more? Do you love more today than you did the first time you trusted Jesus as Lord of your life? Do you have more faith today than you did the first time you trusted Jesus as Lord of your life? Do you serve more today than you did the first time you trusted Jesus as Lord of your life? Do you have more perseverance today than the first time you did when you trusted Jesus as Lord of your life? Do you have more? I pray you do. And so the church, it, it was commended for four things. But then they were faulted. And this is where it gets difficult to listen to. It, we, we really could have broken this, this section of Scripture right here up in about three different sermons, probably more. But, but I want you to, to, to find verse 20, and then let's, let's make our way down. It says, Nevertheless, I have a few things against you because... You allow that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess to teach and to seduce my servants. So they had some faults. Jezebel, it's not the Jezebel of the Old Testament that was married to Ahab. Ahab started off being a good godly king, right? You remember he tore down uh, idols and, and altars. He did all of that. But now he, he married this seductress, this woman named Jezebel who, who was the, the daughter of a king of, of Tyre and one other, church, uh, one other area I can't remember. But, but her father was the king of two different um, areas and she come in and they were really, really good at Baal worship. Really, really good at Baal worship. One of the, the gods that they worshipped as a, a, a Baal god was the god of fertility, they thought. The god, little g god of fertility. As the idea there, and, and it was about sexual immorality. That's one of the ways that they, they worshipped this particular god. And so, as really, probably her name was not Jabez, but, or, or Jezebel, but the idea is the same. She was teaching the church. This word prophetess literally is describing a preacher, someone who sits in, a, in a, an authoritative position and is teaching the church idolatry. Can you imagine? Can you imagine someone teaching up here and saying, it's okay if you want to sleep around with this person and then go over here and sleep with this one, this one, this one, and this one. But it was going on in the early church. Friends, you think that's bad? I've heard about it in this world that we live in. That it's okay if you want to sleep around because God forgives you. God's going to forgive you. But a repentant heart doesn't continue to turn back and do the same sin over and over and over again. Where is the repentance in that? 
And so she was teaching them to commit sexual immorality. And she was teaching that it's okay if you want to do that. And because of the, the mindset of the world that you and I live in today, the idea is, man, that sounds fun. Man, that, that's, that's the church I want to go to. You know, these, these big booming churches, I mean, they're doing all of the things that the world says are okay, but when it comes to really teaching the doctrine and the Word of God, they want to steer clear of that. But I'm going to tell you, if you're going to grow deeper in your relationship with King Jesus, then you've got to study and know all of the Word of God from front to back, middle, all of it. And you can't leave anything out. And the problem in the church was that they were being taught and seduced to commit sexual immorality. But not only that, but to eat things that had been sacrificed to false gods. I'm going to take this, this goat and I'm going to sacrifice this goat to the, to the small g god of fertility. And that's what they would do on the, ba on the altar of the Baal gods. They would sacrifice this animal and then the church would then go and consume that meat that had been sacrificed to a false, foreign, dead God that does not exist except in the minds and the hearts of the people who worshipped that particular God. And so there it was, the, the, the teaching of, of Jezebel. But not only that, Revelation 22 verse 18 and 19 says this, I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of, of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. It's not enough that she was standing up there and she was teaching it's okay to do something that God was said already that it was not okay to do. She was teaching also she, by adding to it and taking away. It is like some of the people in the, world, in the world today, they take bits and pieces of the Word of God. It's just like Satan did in the garden. He said, but did God really say that? And you look at the Word and you find out for yourself, well, well I guess he did really say that. See, that's where study comes in. That's where knowing what the Word says so that you can then apply it to your life. And then you know the teachings of the Word of God, that it is not good for you to follow the, the seductress Jezebel. You follow the teachings of the Word of God. And so not only were they following the teachings of Jezebel, but they continued to tolerate her teachings. They continued to tolerate Listen to what the scripture says. It says in verse 20, Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. You allow this teaching to take place. You allow it. Friends, you need to make sure as a Christ follower, as a church member, as leaders, that whoever stands in the pulpit in front of a congregation is always and only teaching the Word of God. If somebody gets up here and says, it's okay for you to do this, but it contradicts the Word of God, kick them out. They don't need to be here. And you don't need to be afraid that you're going to hurt somebody's feelings. Oh, but they're going to think that we just got rid of him because of this or because of that. Kick him out. You don't play with God's word like that. You, you got to get rid of them. And so they were allowing this, this, this teaching to take place in the church. And there's some corrections. I, I need you to hear this. This was taking place. And then still, even with that, God still allows a way of escape. Isn't that amazing about God? Listen to what the scripture says. He says this, Nevertheless, I have a few things against you because you allow the, this woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants, who commit to commit sexual, sexual immorality and to eat things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality. Someone had gone to her and said, you need to think about what you're teaching. You need to think about what you're saying. You need to think about how you're leading these people astray. 
or, or as she was teaching these things, God was convicting her, but as she was experiencing conviction, she just kept pushing it away and pushing it away, pushing it away until finally her heart had gotten calloused so badly that she didn't even care anymore, that she was te teaching the Word of God in a contradictory way. I gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. You got to think about that in your life. God gives you an opportunity to repent of your sin, whatever that sin might be. It may not be sexual immorality. It may be some other kind of sin. Yet, time and time again, God has convicted you of that sin. And, and time and time again, you just push the spirit away. I don't want that conviction. Get it out of my life. Get it out of my heart. This, I believe, is okay, even though it contradicts the Word of God. You continue to live in it. Not only do you continue to live in it, but then you begin to, to teach others that it's okay for you to live like that. And so you've got to repent of the evil that you're living in. Whatever that is, you've given time to repent. And so let's, let's follow on because this gets, this gets deep. Listen, indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed. If she continues, and she was continuing... Indeed, I will cast her into a sickbed and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation. Consequences to, to remaining and continuing in sin. Consequences. We only want to hear about a good God, a loving God, a kind God. A God that blesses. We don't want to hear about the God that, that puts, puts you on your sickbed or who curses you because you're not obeying the word of God. But here it says it plainly. Not all sickness is brought on by God. You need to understand that. But sin brings it on. And it says, gave her time to repent of her sexual immorality and she did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into a sick bed and those who commit adultery with her into their great tribulation unless they repent of their deeds. Unless. I love that, right? Because that gives somebody like me hope because I can tell you I'm a sinner. Unless I repent my pride for heart, my quick temper, my, my lustful heart, whatever those things are that I'm sinning against God and I know that I'm sinning, God gives me opportunity to repent. He gives me opportunity to repent. And then he says, unless you repent. Then he says this, I'll kill her children with death and all the churches shall know that I am God. For I am he who searches the minds and the hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your works. Wow. This correction is... I'm going to be honest with you. It's sovereign. And even in this correction, you see nothing but grace and mercy. Even, even in this, it says, unless you repent, if you are willing to repent, then God is going to withhold judgment. God is going to withhold sickbed. God is going to withhold great tribulation. He said, I will sin no more. Unless I will, I'm going to send great tribulation unless you repent of your deeds. So you repent of the evil that was allowed. And then it says this. I, I love this. Verse 24 and 25. Now... To you I say, and the rest in Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine, as many as do not hold to this doctrine, as many who do not believe in the church, they were, they were torn. There was one group over here that believed it was okay for you to live a worldly sinful life, and then there was a group of people over here that said, no, I will not sin like that against my God, my creator, my savior, my sustainer. And so, now to you, the group that sin, now, now to those who are not. It says, now to you, I say unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan. Isn't that a statement? Don't you think you should key in on some of these statements that we're, we're discussing this morning? As many of you who have not known the depths of Satan, as many of you who have not fallen into that trap, that temptation, given in in such a way that you're continuing to live that particular lifestyle. 
not known the depths of Satan, as they say, I will put on you no other burden. But hold fast what you have till I come. And so you repent of the evil, but then you hold on to the good things that you're doing. See, I'm not standing up here beating you up. I'm, I'm standing up here trying to edify you to the point that you understand, yes, I have love. Yes, I have faith. Yes, I, I serve. Yes, I'm persistent and I persevere when times even get tough in my life. I have done these things. I, I'm still faithful. I'm continuing to serve. I, I'm, not, I'm not beating you up. I'm saying that if you are doing those things, though, you need to get it right with God today. Because today may be all you have left. That's what God is saying here. Unless you repent of your deeds, unless you repent of your deeds, unless you repent of your deeds. He said this, Know this, I am he who searches the minds and the hearts. This morning, I, I believe very much that's what God is doing. Right now, this very moment, right where you sit, I believe God is searching your mind. I believe God is searching your heart. And I believe you know that God is searching your mind and your heart. And that even now, conviction is swelling up. You can't even hardly swallow right now because you know you're living a disobedient life. Right now, this very moment, you know that you're living a lifestyle of sin. God says no to if God were to be standing before you today and he were to look into your face, he said, Brad, do you think I died on the cross so that you could continue to live a lifestyle of sin? And I'm going to have to respond some way or another, no, Savior. And he's going to look at me and he's going to say, then why do you continue to do it? As he looks in your face today, why do you continue to do it? And you say, Lord, because I'm torn. I'm torn between following you with all of my heart. And I'm torn between living in this world. And he looks at you and he says, you better repent today. Because today, Maybe all the time I give you left. And you've got to respond. Today, you've got to respond. And we come to the point of invitation. Miss Janice, you and Cameron, come on up. See, I don't know where you are. I don't, I don't know what struggles you've experienced. I, I don't know what lifestyle you're living. But God looks at the mind and He looks at the heart. Not the, just this old preacher. But every single one of you in earshot of the message today. But not only you, but also to the whole world. He, he didn't die for only you. The Scripture says He died for the whole world. God sent His Son to die so if you believe in Him, you will not perish. Preacher, that's all well and good. But, but I'm torn. It's, it's so hard to, to live for Jesus today. Yeah, it is. But the Bible also says life is but a vapor. You only have a short time to get it right here on earth. Because you will spend eternity somewhere. Either in God's presence because you've confessed your sin and trusted Jesus to be Lord of your life or in a place called hell. Fire and brimstone are a very real part of that place. Torment day and night. The, the, the gnashing of teeth the Bible talks about. 
ever and ever. And, and not only that, but you're going to be separated from God for eternity. And then the Bible even talks about this rich man in the New Testament when he, because he wouldn't even give the scraps off of his table to a poor beggar. When he died, he, he went to, to hell and he looked up and he could see all the way through this chasm. And he saw his brothers and he just wanted to go back and tell his brothers to do whatever it takes to get it right while you still have life in your breath because one day you're not going to have the opportunity to get it right again. Friends, you have opportunity today. You have opportunity to confess your sin, to repent of your sin, to turn from your sin, to lay it aside, never to do it again. Repent today. Invite Jesus into your heart to be Lord of your life today. Why, preacher, why today? Because life is but a vapor. Life is but a moment. Life is but a fraction of time. And eternity follows. Friend, let me ask you today, where do you want to spend eternity? Let's pray. Father, Lord, this morning it seems in a very real way we are torn between heaven and hell and we don't even realize that we're torn. We're torn between following you and making you Lord of our lives or continuing to live a, a lawless, reckless life without Jesus. Father, I pray this morning that there be even one lost soul who is gathered here with us right now in the name of Jesus that they would acknowledge that they are a sinner. And Father, today that they would repent and they would invite Jesus to be Lord of their lives. Father, save them today. Father, for those who are in the church that have confessed their sin and trusted Jesus to be Lord of their life, yet they remain torn between a life of pleasure and ease or a life of obedience and service. Father, I pray for the Christ follower today that they would be convicted because your word said, unless you repent. Father, today, give us wisdom, the strength, might repent of our sins today, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, this morning, let me encourage you to stand. I encourage you to stand. This morning, you make a decision. Today, you make a decision.